Hi, this is Lindsay, one of the co-hosts of Beauties and Headcanons. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Rachel Mons, host of Hashtag No Filter Friday here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my new show, Hashtag No Filter Friday, where we talk about all of the sexual misconduct allegations swirling around Hollywood. A new show drops every Friday at 8.30 Pacific Standard Time. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of Hashtag No Filter Friday. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. for media hey. and this is disarming disability and you've hopefully you've just listened to the three shows all about media um it was really intense and we had crazy amazing experts so please go back and check out episodes six seven and eight if you haven't listened to those the stuff we're about to talk about probably won't make sense to you yeah. um but hello that's what we're gonna do sarah and i are gonna hey. chat it out hey, hey. i'm sarah tuberty what's up sarah hey. i'm nikki <laughs> kelly um, which is fun. What's going on? What's on your mind? Um, no, it's just, it's really fun thinking about media again. Um, because like, yes, I consume media, of course. Right. And like, yes, I think it's important, but I'm not like in on, like, I don't know lots of things about it. I sort of see it as it comes. I'll like maybe see this movie here and there. Maybe I watch a TV show, but truthfully, I'm doing so many projects that that's like the one big joke of my life is like, I don't watch TV. So people are like, Oh, Game of Thrones. I'm like, I just, um, sure. That's been like a very what pivotal thing in like American culture that I, I like don't know anything about. Like there's people and they fight <laughs> over things. I, but really, I literally can tell you nothing about it. Um, and I don't right. know actors names. I don't know movies. I don't know. The, like, so this is just a world that like, yes, I see things, but I don't know it as intimately as I suppose like an average consumer would. Um, so it's been really Like, it makes me want to engage in it more and, like, really, like, understand where disability is. Because I know that that's something that isn't being seen on TV, right? Because I'm, even in the, like, little glimpse of things that I do see, I'm not seeing people with disabilities there. Um, But then just even thinking that it is important to be active in this and, and to understand what is happening. Because, really, media is shaping a lot of our social understanding of what we're viewing and how we perceive different things. I think we learn a lot of social scripts in media, right? I, and I say that in the context of this just reflecting on being like a kid and learning how to go on a date. So I feel like I learn how to go on dates via whatever TV shows or movies that I saw, like you hold hands on your first date or something. And this is what middle school looks like. Whereas like, those aren't things that my friends were telling me necessarily. And those weren't things that my parents were telling me necessarily. So these are some social scripts that I'm learning as a young adult. Um, and again, dating is one example. I just thought it was a funny one to put out there. Um, but just like no, how important totally... media is and understanding what I'm seeing, why I'm seeing it and why I'm not seeing other things. It totally makes sense. I weirdly, this area in particular kind of is one of my interests. And so it's something that I have always been kind of particularly clued into. But also, even though I was clued into it, clueless. So (laughs) my antidote for you is literally my life story. (laughs) So I did, I did go to, I have a degree in directing and theater management. That is my undergraduate degree. Entering into school, um, I had a choice to make. I knew that I wanted to act, but when I was looking at the world, I did not see a single body on stage in a movie, in a TV show that looks like my body. So I quite literally thought it was impossible to do the thing that I wanted to do. I didn't think it was even possible to be an actor. So I got my degree in something that was 
not at all acting. I totally, mm-hmm. if I had two hands, I 100% would have had an acting degree. Like yeah. that, facts, that's facts. Um, so it's funny because then I went to New York City and I was working backstage on Broadway shows and I still had that itch to be on stage. And I was like, I can't be on stage here. I want to be on stage here, but I can't, I can't, I can't. Mm-hmm. Where can I be on stage? Where can I be on stage? And that's honest to God. That's how I ended up in pageants is that was an opportunity for me to audition for a part where all I had to do was be myself. I got to be yeah. on stage. I got to speak. I got to sing. I got to do all of the things that I wanted to do in the mm-hmm. acting world, but literally couldn't do or thought I couldn't do. So I went and I did it in this parallel universe that was pageantry, um, which is crazy. Like that is in real, although I didn't realize at the time, maybe as, maybe that was a lot of suppressed things. And mm-hmm. I, I, I hadn't worked through the reality of, yes, this is because I have one hand, you know, I might've, I probably was living in a space of denial where I wasn't mm-hmm. really admitting that out loud, but a hundred percent, that's, that's what it is now as a very self-aware person. And as yeah. somebody who's done the emotional homework, that's totally what it was. And I think yes. it also comes in line too, that doing something, especially like groundbreaking in that sense and being like, I don't see anybody. Let me back up. I think that in that path, we need mentorship. We need to see a path. We need to see some sort of steps to get from A to B, right? If you want to be an actor or an actress, and and these are things you want to do, like there need to be tangible steps to see. So if you don't see anybody at the end that has anybody that's remotely similar to yours, then how can you make up those steps to get there if we don't have that end goal? In both of our lives, and I think that you've probably received these messages, and I've received these messages too, that like we are both very empowered women, and that we we both take on lots of projects and we are doing new things in the world and we are big advocates and we are really confident in our lives and it's really beautiful but there was times where that wasn't true so I think that it's important to be like yes like I am feisty like yes I do work hard yes I can see these things but it also gets to a point where I need to see that end goal and I can make up steps and I can push myself forward and I think we all all make up steps and push ourselves forwards but there has to be something helping us and guiding us along that way so whether that be the program's whether that be mentorship, whether that be even just seeing a picture of somebody doing something and you're like, yes, I know that that exists. I know that I can get there. I can make up the steps in between. I can build my own path. But if we really, if we don't have that end destination, then we're just sort of wandering around and and then choosing other things where that end goal seems more tangible. So this makes me think of Barbie almost when we were kids. And that was when Barbie suddenly was getting jobs. And, you know, you could get buy Barbie as a doctor, you could buy Barbie as a uh, NASA astronaut, all of these different jobs that they wanted kids to start visualizing and seeing themselves in these roles. And, you know, as somebody who is interested in arts and media and theater, like I was looking for people who had differences and not seeing them. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's really exciting that we're entering into this space where where our bodies are becoming more mainstream, but also I think building up and making the resources that that Tallery and Lawrence and Christine talked about all of the organizations that exist specifically to support people with disabilities, those please seek those out. Mm -hmm. Those are the places and the people in the community who are doing the things that that you want to do, that you want to be involved in, that you could be in the middle of. Yes. Um, so yes, and I those think are all, all, yet again. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say all the links on our website. So check that out. Go ahead. Yes, please do. And I think it's cool because like this has been actively building for a long time. Um, and I feel that we're, we're coming up on the sort of big push where it becomes mainstream. Um, and, and I think that we're working on uniting all of these different silos of communities. We're working on uniting, um, both the people who have disabilities and who don't have, don't have disabilities, um, to really build that this becomes a yes. And, um, to use, uh, Christine's words there where this is, this is normal. And I think about this a lot, like as a child, going back to Barbie being a doctor and Barbie holding jobs, like I had a mother who was a career mother. She did lots of really incredible things. She was an administrator of nursing home. Um, So in my mind, like 
feminism wasn't a thing or like job inequality wasn't a thing. So like how, because as a four year old, that's what I saw. I saw that my mom was working in these roles. Like I didn't think anything of it. And so how beautiful to live in a world where that's what I perceive to be truth as. Um, and then to learn that we're still working through that struggle. Absolutely. But as a child, that's my yes. And like, please tell me something I don't know. Like, please, this should be something that should just exist and be normal. Um, and so I think that that's a really beautiful advantage we have now to, to raise our children in a post-ADA world, to raise our children in a world where they do see themselves in media represented. And that extends beyond disability. That extends sort of any minority group that exists um, in all totally types agree. of bodies, all, all types of bodies, um, disability or not. Um, and, and showing them there. And so that then we raise a kid, raise our children in a world where they see these things and they're like, yes. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Agreed. I totally agree. If you, yeah, if you don't, if you are looking for your idols, if you are looking up and looking for the people that, that are you, but 10, 15, 20 years older than you, the people you want to grow into becoming, but you don't see them there then then what are you supposed to do right and and so i'm just thankful that we really are entering into a world where it it is becoming mainstream Mm -hmm. and it's thanks to the work of literally the three people the three experts we had on our show in addition to of course a whole crew of other people but really those three are majorly at the forefront of this work um yeah and just yet again the idea of of seeing it is making it is normalizing it and i know a lot of people in our community when we talk we talk about words a lot and how to use them i know a lot of people hate using the word normal Mm -hmm. and but but at the same time all i want to do is normalize the word disability it should be should be a part of conversation it should be a part of identity it should be not more than a second thought, right? Yeah. And we're a long ways away from that being a reality, and that's okay. Right. Um, but that should be the goal, right? Yeah. Where these are so. things to expect. And I think that comes back to things we've said before, where we're looking at our hands and our arms and like, these are options. Like these are, yes. these are all parts of human variation. We are all humans here on this planet. Yes. And that these are things to expect and not be surprised when we see them. I'm just thinking back now, the first part of this chapter of media specifically was Lawrence. And Lawrence really was discussing his light bulb moment when he actually woke up and realized that he was a part of a community that people thought were better dead (laughs) than actually alive. And, you know, go back and listen if you didn't hear it, but essentially he was in a movie theater um, watching Million Dollar Baby. And when the audience cheered, at the end, because because they actually killed the main character, he his light bulb turned on and he said, oh, my gosh, this is there's so much stigma attached to this. There's so many ideas attached to this that just aren't true. I have to get active. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering, can you share with us what your light bulb moment was? I know probably in various forms we've talked about it, but I don't know if we've used it in the terms of light bulb moment. So I'd love to hear that from you. Yes. Um, so my light bulb moment was um, when I was in school to be an occupational therapist. And again, this is, I'm probably 27 years old, maybe 28 years old when I'm reading this. Um, and my big light bulb moment was the social structure of disability that I read. It was um, an excerpt from a book called Stigma by um, Goffman that was written in 1963, which um, is it's been around for a little while um, and it's been circulating in our world for a little while. Um, And it sort of talks about this in group and out of group alignment and how people with disabilities are perceived to be less than um, because they have these bodies, if you will, that are like not seen as being helpful. And, And then there is this assumption that they're not able to do things. Therefore they get put in this sort of outcast category and then have all these social limitations put on top of them. And then that's what everybody thinks people with disability are. And then that outcast group is then those social, if we're talking about social scripts again, those social scripts of that outcasted group are only reinforced with the media that we're consuming. Because again, we're writing the social script saying that, yes, they're better off dead or like, oh, it's so wonderful that they're able to put on their shoes and this is so powerful, but whatever, they woke up and we should praise them for waking up. And I can't believe that they're living the world and the bodies that they do. And they're so inspirational, right? So it's the 
those two different things we did talk about with Lauren, but I feel like those social scripts are reinforced. So then we're teaching mainstream society that that's the truth of people living with disability and that it only reconfirms that out of group alignment. So then people with disability, that's the images that they're receiving about themselves too. Those are the social scripts that they're learning. Um, and then they take on those limitations and then they don't pursue acting because they think that they can't be there. I mean, that's something that we just talked about existing in your life as well. Um, in that mm -hmm. there are those perceived limitations that, oh, I'm, I'm not able to do X, Y, and Z because I don't see myself doing it because I've been told by these social scripts, not super knowing that this is what's happening, um, that I can't, I can't be there and I shouldn't be there and I should be somewhere else or I should exist somewhere else. And then people in that out of group can either take on that idea, identity, which we sort of talked about, or they can reject it and then become this like heightened social awareness and then use that in turn to teach the larger society that actually the social scripts that were currently existing are not helpful. They're not true. Um, and so we need to stop them and rewrite what truth is. So I feel Feel like that was a big light bulb moment for me too and where I really took on being somebody with a disability because again my life and your life and we've talked about that before has been I I don't I am not disabled disabled is a bad word those are people that can't do anything they're quote-unquote helpless they're quote-unquote broken like we we need whatever they're not something you want to be they're less than normal and so that way I am not going to be a part of them. I don't want to be associated with any of that. But at the same time, all of that negative stigma I've experienced my whole life too. I just didn't know that that's what it was. So it's been this really empowering moment to take on like, yes, I am somebody who identifies with the disability community. And I just feel so much more empowered. And I, and I think like it's again, another one of those like duh taglines that we learn as children um, is that knowledge is power. And so really like learning that and, and having that knowledge that like, yes, I am a part of this disability community. I know that these social scripts are not true. Now I have the power to rewrite them and help build a more inclusive world altogether. So I know that that's what we're doing with our podcast or what we hope to do with our podcast and, and being able to talk through and dissect these further but also really work to rewrite those social scripts that we're putting in the media that we're consuming so that what we are putting out there does accurately reflect the lived experience of people with disability. And knowing that, again, everybody's lived experience will kind of be a little bit different here and there. But um, but there is these larger overarching themes that do transcend everybody that does live with a disability. And we can rewrite them because they're not true. And it's simple, if you will. Like, it's not that hard. To, I mean, air quotes here. But these are absolutely tangible things to do. We've got lots of social barriers that we're facing that makes it really hard work. But it's not unattainable. We can do it. We totally can do it. Another thing which we talked about is, is the word inspiration porn. Mm -hmm. And so I, for those of you, just as a refresher, inspiration porn is... Um, the news, media, TV, whatever, whatever outlet it is, telling stories about disability and the disability experience, but telling it in a way to make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. So here is Johnny who asked Sarah, who has Down syndrome, to prom. Isn't Johnny the best boy that's ever existed because he's taking this little girl to prom? Like those kinds of stories, um, being told from that lens are just the worst. <laughs> I was going to try to think of a uh, like more educated way to say that, but they're just the worst. They're the worst. Uh, they're just the worst. And when you don't give the person with a disability a seat at the table to talk about that experience and to, to share it in an educational way, all you are doing is perpetuating the idea that people with disabilities are less than and that is exactly what you do not want to be doing, right? That is the wrong message for the 21st century in, wh in which we live in. And I, I would like to think that people are starting to wake up to that idea, but you don't see it being completely gone. In fact, so I, when I went back to grad school, it was for journalism, and I only did stories on disability the whole time I was there because I was so, so, so angry about literally the term inspiration porn. I, I hated um, I hated inspiration porn, so I was convinced I was going to learn all the ways to undo inspiration porn. Um, and and so we had to be studying different nightly news shows as part of our graduate school 
And one of the shows we had to study was The Nightly News with Lester Holt, which is one of the main stake television shows that happens at night. And Lester Holt every night ends his show with, I'm not going to be able to say what the segment is called specifically, but it is 100% always an inspiration porn story that he's telling where he is going into a camp. And many of our, Sarah, many of our friends in our community of um, of amputees, there have been a couple of organizations that have been highlighted and it hurts me every time it happens because they actually go in and they talk about, um, yeah, they talk, it's, it's absolutely inspiration porn. So I, I yeah. say that it's getting better. But I also, also feel <laughs> that there's a lot of very sad, dramatic music that gets played with it too. Always. Well, and it's always taking the spin on look at how less than they are mm-hmm. and look at look at how other people who are normal are doing something to make their lives better. And that's completely the exact wrong message um, of what to be sending and what we want to be receiving. So so just um, I guess if you're one of my news media friends <laughs> on here, just remember that I'm watching you. <laughs> yeah, she is. Nikki is going to. But also right. start start being a smart consumer, right? Christine, with Christine, we use that word a lot, and we talked about that a lot. Be a smart consumer. You get to choose where your money is going, where where your views are going, and don't don't consume the media that you know is not helping our community. You have the power to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, and 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 I think that comes into what we talked about with Tolerate as well is that um, to be like get ourselves at the table. So working on how to make places accessible so that like yes, we are choosing not to consume this media, um, but we can also choose to be a part of changing the story. Some people may feel called to do those things, um, but help rewriting all of those things as well. So so like helping to support theaters that are accessible, like helping to work and be on boards or whatever, provide feedback and to help make um, theater spaces accessible or, or to believe in that conversation or to help include disability at the conversation when we are working about building different spaces for people to be able to access the media that they want to access in ways that um, can authentically portray it. Um, and then also work to be like, we need you. We need you as writers. We need you as directors. We need you as actors. We need you as actresses. Um, um, we need you as costume designers. We need you as makeup artists. All of these components that get involved. Well, and I feel like the important part of that, though, is is many of us who are that perhaps are are filling these roles. We just aren't filling these roles with the understanding and intention that we bring the disability lens. And so what good is that doing for our community when we're trying to to push it forward? And And when we have brothers and sisters who who do need more tools in order to break mm-hmm. down the barriers. You know, you might not be somebody who who needs closed captioning when you go to see a movie, but you know, our brothers and sisters do. So if you're working in that industry, that issue is your in- issue as well. Mm-hmm. And and just being more mindful and open to the fact that that voice and these issues, they're a part of the fabric of who you are and the culture of who you are. So to be okay with owning that and taking that on and having those conversations with people, not, not only in our community, but in your workspace as well. No, that is absolutely really important because again, we're humans. We are all part of this human experience together and there's lots of different kinds of humans um, and I think it's really wonderful to to help make sure that we are providing things that humans can be able to access I totally agree I totally agree so now I'm thinking back to yeah the episode with Tallery we really talked about about being the co- consumer and going into these spaces and what organizations are doing to make live events in particular um, places that are comfortable and welcoming. And I loved mm-hmm. that in that conversation, Sarah, you likened it to just being a good host. Like when you have a friend come over to your house, mm-hmm. is that chair comfortable for you? Would you like lemonade or would you like coffee? Would you, you know, like you were throwing out these examples that we do every day in our everyday life when we like a person and want to hang mm-hmm. out with them and invite them to our house. That's all like that thought process is the thought process that should be happening at not only these live event spaces, these media consuming spaces, literally across the board and all corporate offices in literally whatever's 
situation you're going into. Hopefully, if you are hosting people, that's the thought process that we want people to have. We won't, we don't want it to be, we don't want, want to have to be aggressive and be like, these are my rights and I'm standing up for them. We will do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But also we would much rather be greeted at the door with, Welcome to our space. Would you like yes. coffee or would you like yes. lemonade? <laughs> right. And and that that's we're welcoming everyone to that space. It's not just people with disability. It's it's anybody that was welcomed into that theater. That yes, that we are people and that we have that we are people. Just that's it. We're people. That's it. We're people. Yes. We're people. We're yes. not. <laughs> we can be this is my favorite thing to tell people is when we're talking about just disabilities in general. And probably it comes up when I'm talking about inspiration porn. I'm like People with disabilities can be really good people. They can be really horrible people. They can have really sad days. They can have really happy happy days. They can be complete assholes to people. They can be the kindest humans. Like literally we are experiencing the same emotions as everybody else. And Mm -hmm. um, so tell our stories in that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me think of um, something I was learning in one of my occupational therapy classes. We were talking about, um, we had a whole section on assistive technology. It was a course that we took. And we talk about communication boards there. And And I appreciate BU. I went to Boston University. And I appreciate Boston University so much in adding this to the conversation that it's like if we have a 37-year-old male who wants curse words in on his communication board, like, we should put them there because yes, he's 37 and like he has the right to use curse words if he wants to. And he has the right to write the language. It doesn't have to be very eloquently like proper English because who speaks like that on a day-to-day life? But because he is unable to produce the words himself via his body, whatever, that doesn't mean that he's not thinking them. That doesn't mean that these, the way that we use our words shapes who we are as people, what we believe in our personality. So like, of course we should integrate slang. We should integrate curse words because that's who he is and that's who he wants and he's a person who has the right to use them and it was such like a duh like duh moment but so powerful to underline that that's really important so like yes build this communication board for what is going to work for this person because oh my god he's a person because he's a person who wants Mm -hmm. to say (laughs) yeah who who has a lot of effing to say (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome no that's a really good yeah that's a good example Sarah anything else on your mind I I have so many things on my mind but I feel I think this is I think we are good I think we covered it for this moment cool so yeah I mean I feel like we could talk about this specific medium so much but I feel like the big overarching theme and picture is just number one freaking show us. We are here. We are a huge part of the percentage of the population. 20, 20, 20% 20 of the population. Number number two, there are resources and community and people who exist, who are working in this space. There are people doing that work. So you can reach out and you can find them. They are experts. They are bridging those gaps. Um, And number three is we are just people. I feel like that's always going to be the number three on every list that we make. We are just people. Yeah, that's what's on my brain. So I feel like hopefully after listening to that, those were the kind of big picture items that you took away too. Let us know what thoughts that you have. Remember to check out our website because there you will not only find the episodes, but you will find the coloring pages that we have from our artists. Mm -hmm. You will find actual questions, prompted questions for you to fill out along with the episode to get you thinking. And then of course, there are all those amazing resource links there for you. So if we talked about it, it's there it's clickable you can reach see those resources yourself and also there is a transcription posted up there of every episode as well if you're wanting to read through so please please use that and make sure you're checking that out and investigating that world yes 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 great well thank you so much for being a part of everything that is going on in, in this whole world and we're so appreciative for you taking the time to listen um, and then taking the time to think and taking the time to have conversations with people on the street or people that you love anywhere to just just move all of this forward we want to give special thanks to our network public house media for our intro beats jason barnes at cybernetics for our logo art patrice you can find him at normalpersons.com and Matt Meldrum and Ryan Louie, our two-handed technical team. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or publichousemedia.org. Follow us on Twitter at Disarm Disable. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Disarming Disability. And check out our website, disarmingdisability.com. See you next week. Bye.